I want to say a big thank you and introduce our keynote. So, Christina, what can I say about Christina? I used to, um, <laughs> I used to um, see Christina pop up all the time in the um, Mahara forums, and this is when she was a, a learning technologist back in Luxembourg. And I'd have questions when I first started out with Mahara, and I'd go to the forums and see that she'd already asked them. And it was just so wonderful to see that there was somebody there with you know, a similar mindset to mine. And I was so thrilled when she joined Catalyst and I'm part of the Mahara team. Um, the photo here was the first time we met in real life in Leipzig all those years ago. It was the Moodle Mahara moot in Germany. And it was so wonderful to see. 2012, yep, eight years ago, wow. We looked so young. <laughs> Time flies, Sam. <laughs> it really, really does. It really, really does. But um, so I'm now going to hand over to Christina, who's going to be talking to us about supporting formal and informal learning in Mahara. Now, Christina, do you want me to hand over to you or do you want to just take the reins and go for it? I think you've already ah. taken the reins, haven't you? <laughs> I just took the presenter permissions, if that is okay, Sam. Thank you. Absolutely. So, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm just going to get ready for... Uh, screen sharing. Um, I do have the chat open in another window, so uh, it should all work out perfectly, ideally, um, to make this um, happen with you. I'm really excited to see so many of you in, in this virtual event today. Um, thank you very much for organizing it, uh, Sam, Orly and Richard and everybody else who's been helping in the background. Thank you for everybody who's been putting presentations forward, um, who volunteered, put up their hand to run the session, and then also to our experts, who really are experts and have been in the community for a very long time. I'm really excited to be able to join this morning um, and then watch the afternoon sessions afterwards on the recording. It's been certainly an interesting several months and um, so what we thought of looking at in in this presentation now is how Mahara can help support formal and informal learning and um, I'm going to demonstrate that mainly using the Mahara roadmap so items that we've already developed and things that are still coming up and other things that are more blue sky thinking and hopefully we'll be able to implement at some point in the future. So I hope there is uh, something there for, for everybody. And um, towards the end, you'll also have the chance to share your ideas of how you are using Mahara already, um, maybe also how you have changed um, your teaching with Mahara over the last few months and uh, can share that either directly here in Big Blue Button in the shared notes or also in a, a Padlet for which I'll give you the link later on. But let's get started. So we've seen the Catalyst map earlier on um, where we have a lot of um, offices now across the world, but I wanted to show you where, where we have Mahara user groups, um, where we have uh, community members who are organizing events. And you can see there are actually quite a few out there. Um, we have one in Aotearoa, New Zealand, in Australia, in Japan, there's a very active one with a conference every single year. Um, then we have Mac US, which kind of started out more as a global Mahara user group. Um, Canada is uh, represented um, in Ottawa primarily. Then we have the German user group that meets on an annual basis also around the event that they have um, the Francophone uh, user group Makara, which I believe was the very first one that came on board and that had grown out of one of these um, physical events that we used to have um, just a few months ago. And then MUM, which is organized primarily by Teresa um, from the University of Warwick, and then Maxi, which um, Aurelie and Sam had been leading for a number of years. And there can be many, many more. 
um, I think there is an agenda item later on today to kind of come together in those user groups, but to also see if there are any others um, interested in maybe creating a group to organize regional events um, to get together and um, foster the use of Mahara. And as we've seen in the chat earlier, um, Lisa had mentioned that Mahara is all about community and that's what she likes about it. And Sigi then saying yes from the start. And that's exactly what we are trying to do. Um, we are distributed across the entire globe. And while of course, a certain user groups are concentrated in certain parts of the world, that doesn't mean that there aren't any others in, in the rest of those continents and um, big pieces of a land that are empty and don't have user groups there. And it is a fantastic way to really get together to discuss things in person or in virtual events and um, look at particular questions um, that come up in your regions. And then, of course, also come together in these bigger events where everybody can um, contribute and um, share their ideas and um, also bring forward comments and maybe even have a themed event like um, the UK group had in the past with the Mahoodle Fest, where it was um, really going, um, where the topics really were Mahara and Moodle together. But now, over the last few months, Things have changed quite dramatically, um, not just in regards to conference attendance and the, the possibilities of um, seeing people face to face, but really they, um, our entire lives have been in an upheaval and there's been a lot of change. So what we've seen oh, um, is isolation, um, physical distancing, disruptions to personal lives, work lives, and then also quite a bit of uncertainty um, that has crept in in every aspect of lives. And as we can also see from, from the people who shared their webcam, they are blurred boundaries. Um, at least at some point, everybody had to work from home um, and is joining conferences from their home computers with family. They are also needing computers, um, work homeschooling children, and really having a very different work environment as well as also very personal life because they, everything just gets blurred. They are not um, the, the boundaries anymore as much as uh, many of us had in the past. Of course, there have always been people who have also already worked from home, but for the majority, I think it was definitely a new experience, not just working from home for a day or two, but really for a very long stretch of time. And that, of course, also shifted the focus um, of what work needed to be, what could be achieved, um, what was suddenly important, and especially in the education sector where you are all operating, curricula had to be changed at the drop of a head and everything needed to be revamped and suddenly also equipment needed to be made available to students or to staff um, or looked at, well, how can we manage with the resources that we have available um, where we might not have the best possibilities. And we also need to change everything around. So really also in particular changing assessments um, because suddenly it was not possible anymore to have hundreds of students in a lecture theater taking an exam at the same time. But still students needing to graduate, wanting to graduate. Um, so what do you do? So there's been lots and lots of change, which of course also resulted, I think for a lot of people also in a lot of exhaustion because it's really been very dramatic, um, three, four, in some cases, five or six months already, um, where there is lots and lots of change that has come about and not really a lot of time to bring that about. On the other hand, we've also seen a lot of good things coming out of these past few months. So there's been a lot of sharing going on. Um, just going to Twitter, you can see educators in particular share tips, um, 
open webinars that would have earlier on only been available to a small number of people on campus are now suddenly available to the rest of the world. There's lots of networking going on. People share tips, people work together, people give advice and um, really try to make the best out of the situation because we all know it is new. It is something that we need to deal with, that we need to come to grips with. And that, of course, also results in a lot of innovation. And I'm sure we'll see more and more of it because with that innovation, then also comes the opportunity to really instill change, to bring change about, and hopefully in a lot of ways, not really go back to the old ways and only see this as a very temporary measure at the moment. And um, so that change, of course, if we are looking at um, the education sector and in particular, of course, our area here of portfolios, I think in a lot of ways um, can produce a lot of good change for the portfolio community. Um, on the previous slide, we've seen kind of all where there are Mahara user groups and one group that I forgot um, to mention on that map is actually ePortfolios Ireland. Um, they are not on there um, because they are not an official Mahara user group, but they are actually really, really instrumental in Europe. And um, they're in particular um, the team around Lisa Donaldson and also Karen and everybody else in Ireland who's very active in that community because they are really bringing everybody together, organizing events just this week, a Pomodoro session of getting um, working on the portfolio. And so all of these are opportunities to step out of our normal ways of how we have done things in the past, because right now we are just forced to do things differently. And that I think is where the portfolios can come in and it can be extremely beneficial in education because they allow for a different way of doing things than for a lot of organizations have been done in the past. And that means in particular bridging the formal learning spaces to the informal learning spaces and bringing those closer together, making it possible that especially with those blurred boundaries that we now have more and more, and that we are not having the separation so much into this is all just formal and this is what I do outside of class, but that it is becoming more natural to bring all of those conversations um, that are happening outside of the classroom or outside of an education institution into it and have those learning experience present as well. And that I think is where Mahara can help because we have features that work well in formal education settings, but also those that support informal learning and making those learning experiences visible um, so that we can then really work from, from a learning environment that doesn't really distinguish so much um, between the formal and informal, but really takes the learner and has the learner in their center in order to give them the most possibilities to present their learning, to advance their learning, and also to connect with people. And so I'm go going to try to show that to you on the Mahara roadmap. Um, kind of really looking at, very briefly of course, um, at certain features that help with for informal learning settings and then also in the informal ones and where we can also see the connection then between the two. And, and in some a lot of cases, um, features can also be used in, in both of these settings. The Mahara roadmap itself consists of five big areas. And so in each release, we are looking into advancing things in all five areas, sometimes and one more than the other, but we are always looking to make sure that we have usability improvements, that there are some feature development, new things getting into Mahara, that we also have technology updates to stay current with um, what is going on in the world and um, maybe also use some newer technologies, have issue resolution because sometimes there are bugs that are just creeping into the code, um, and then also keeping our community infrastructure up to date. So if you're taking brief looks at each individual of these roadmap items, um, I'd like to start with the usability improvements. 
So in particular here, I'm going to look at the last two releases, Mahara 19.10 and Mahara 2004, which was just released in April this year during lockdown, which was certainly an interesting experience. So lots of kudos to, to the rest of my team who's been doing wonderfully and uh, made it possible that the release got out right on time. And many of you might already be familiar with those features or have seen them or these usability improvements or hopefully at latest can look forward to getting an upgrade this summer um, because we have a new layout editor that makes it possible and much, much easier to work with and change the layouts in on the Mahara page. Um, then we also have the placeholder blocks. Um, kind of more lovingly dubbed magic blocks. Um, that was a feature conceived um, by Dublin City University, in particular Lisa Donaldson and uh, Mark Glynn, um, where it is now possible to really work much better with templates and leave it up to learners to decide what sort of evidence they would like to put into a particular area on their page where you might only want to make a heading available and then leave it up to them whether they want to upload an image, text or video or audio file rather than setting that already um, at the start and therefore giving students more freedom to work according to their preferences, yet also still making it so that um, assessment requirements are met. And we have the details mode, which makes it possible to have more of a presentation portfolio, not interrupted by um, a number of links for feedback or details, but really kind of taking a step back with them, yet at the same time still have them available for lecturers and tutors that might need them in order to assess a portfolio. We also put in menu consolidations in order to get rid of some overhead of where to find things and making too many decisions before you actually get to a page. And then also looking into humanizing the language in Mahara. So we got rid of user. Um, the only difficulty right now that I have is Mahara user group. Um, we'll need to find a new term for that one um, because we don't always want to be reminded of the, the negative um, connotations that that term has and therefore really look at um, calling people people um, in order to humanize the language more. One Usability improvement um, out of a number that we'd still like to do at some point is block type consolidations. Um, again, so that we take away some of that initial overhead of needing to make too many decisions before you can put content on a page. So for example, we have four different um, block types for journals. Um, then we have two different block types for audio and video. Um, we have two different block types for images and so on. So the, there's a number of things that we can certainly simplify in order to make it easier, especially for those that um, are new to Mahara. Looking at the new features, um, we have plans that can be used as templates um, that can be set up directly in order to also create personal learning plans for students. Um, we have the PDF export that is experimental, um, more on the personal learning side. We have custom header backgrounds so that it's easy for students to um, make the portfolio pages their own by putting their own images into a header and therefore representing themselves really. And of course, we also have some um, administrative features to make it easier for organizations, in particular larger ones, to set up and maintain Mahara more easily through automations. And so SAML automations came in quite extensively in Mahara 2004. Um, but of course, there's more that is possible through using web services. We'll also have a new theme in Mahara 2010 because we've had our current themes for quite a while now. So we thought um, it's high time that we give you another one. And um, we are also in the process of putting the final, um, final um, finishing touches onto the assignment submission plugin. Now, one of the bigger features that we are still hoping to implement at some point um, is the smart evidence enhancements um, that would make it possible 
to also use smart evidence with um, individual learning evidence instead of just pages. And we've already started the discussions with a number of organizations, um, had a good proposal that is um, on the wiki that we can then link to later in the discussion and um, really are looking for funding for that because that is a very big project um, that can then not necessarily be done by just by one single organization and um, the nice thing about smart evidence uh, about these enhancements is also in particular that it could then work with a mobile device so that when you use Mahara Mobile, you can immediately tag your learning evidence with a particular competency and um, or multiple competencies, and then put that into a portfolio that is automatically shared with, um, with a training advisor. And they can see that evidence come up instead of um, necessarily putting it on individual pages. So really rethinking how we can also work with smart evidence um, so that it can fit more um, groups of people, um, fit more requirements and not just the, the initial uh, use case that we had, but also work much better for apprenticeship degrees in particular um, or for people that are really mainly evidence-based and do not need to do as much curation as is the case then oftentimes in education. Technical updates, um, those are usually the ones that are in the background that you don't really see so, so much. Um, but there's been quite a bit of improvements. So we're walking the modern lines with PHP 7.4 and also support for MySQL 8. Um, we still prefer Postgres, um, but lots of people in the community work with MySQL. Um, we are working on Mahara Mobile, to which I'll say a few more words later on. Also do CSS consolidations to make it easier to create custom themes and also maintain those custom themes more easily. And um, we have started on the investigation of um, the accessibility standards, the new ones for uh, WCAG 2.1 in order to see what we need to do in, um, to stay compliant. And um, Currently, we are in the research phase for that investigation so that we can then come up with a priority list um, of things to work on. One other thing that would be good to do is um, the LTI 1.3 support, which is now already available in Moodle, um, which would give us some more possibilities going forward um, with that part of technology. Issue resolution is something that is ongoing. And uh, if you didn't already know how we are deciding on which bugs to fix, um, we are doing that because um, at Catalyst in New Zealand, we are prioritizing those bugs based on severity. And that can be small projects to very large projects. And if you have find a problem that you feel like that should be fixed, funding always helps there to move that up in the priority list and then still give it back to the community. Now, those are all the things that kind of go into the code base of Mahara. Um, but of course, we also have some surrounding infrastructure that we need to keep, um, which means to or which helps run the code base or helps keep things updated. So those are not really concerned with anything learning related really, but we just need those things in order to keep the project running. And so one of those things is our BHEAD automation suite, which um, also helps you actually um, during updates and upgrades because you can run a whole host of tests automatically and don't have to lift a finger in order to run those tests through and make sure that your environment still works. So that heavily reduces the necessity for manual testing and therefore gives you back some time of your day. Um, the Mahara manual, the underlying infrastructure was upgraded to Python 3 so that we are also in support with um, our infrastructure there. And in New Zealand, we are currently testing um, cloud environments for testing purposes so that we can automatically always have an up-to-date database um, and can just pull a patch from code review and test that. 
That is one thing that we also want to make available to the rest of the community to support um, testing of bugs and new features so that you as learning designers, as instructional designers, instructional technologists have easier access to features that are in development and are then more easily able to give us feedback. We also want to move away from Launchpad for our bug reporting over to GitLab um, because then we uh, would be able to look into making it so that your mahara.org username and password is also immediately giving you access to our bug and feature tracker, therefore making it faster for you to report things, to discuss um, any ideas and so on. And kind of slightly going back to, to what I had said earlier and making language more human in Mahara, um, that we are also looking into having more inclusive terms, um, in particular in Git, in our code base, um, and remove terminology that um, has long been overdue and needs to be updated because um, those very politicized terms do not have a place in the code base and just don't make um, a number of people feel welcome in the community. So like other projects, um, for example, Moodle and also Red Hat, we are looking into getting rid of terms like whitelisting and blacklisting, as well as master brand and um, just give them some more neutral terms that make everybody feel more welcome, like main brand, for example, or deny list and allow list and things that even make it much, much clearer of what it is. And um, that, of course, in today's politi political climate is important to take into consideration and really make a change there um, so that we stay welcome to everybody in the community and do not just pay uh, lip service to that. So those were a number of changes um, that we either have already made, are making or will make in the future. Um, that influence the technology as well as in particular also the pedagogy and what you can do with Mahara by having supportive technology available that allows you to be flexible in what you want to do. And so I just briefly like to take you through a couple of those in a little bit more detail. And um, one of the more important things of course these days is increasingly the mobile devices and Mahara Mobile as application is one of them. So the, the initial uh, development work for that goes way, way back to um, Southampton Solent University when it was still called that and not uh, just Solent University, when Roger Emery approached us and said, hey, I want to use portfolios, but my students are at sea, don't have internet access, what can we do? And that's when um, Mahara Droid was um, really born and over the years it was further developed and then about five years ago we issued Mahara Mobile and now it's time to kind of change the technology because certain things didn't quite work anymore, other things are not supported um, by certain operating systems and so we have a quite a big party going on in at Catalyst in New Zealand to make a new Mahara Mobile available which you can also already download if you have an Android device. Um, iOS is still coming and it also incorporates our new newer branding. So you can still upload files, take photos, journal entries, record audio and then also upload video and um, already change the names, give descriptions, um, upload files directly into folders where they need to be and you have that upload queue so that you don't have to be online all the time when you want to create your learning evidence. As I said, it is already available on Google Play. Um, you will need to deinstall the old Mahara mobile um, application though, because we switch technologies, it is not possible to just do an easy upgrade. And iOS version is coming soon. Um, while we are working with React Native for the techies amongst you, and it is possible to have one application and then make that available on both Android and iOS, um, there are a few things that do still need to be updated for it. And so this 
feature, um, Mahara Mobile as app, can be used for both informal learning as well as formal learning because students have their mobile phones with them wherever and can take photos and then use them in either context and upload them into their portfolios from where they can then grab them and put them into the pages depending on what they would like to showcase. Now, the second feature that I'd like to um, introduce you to is um, definitely more for the formal learning context, and that is the Mahara Assignment Submission plugin for Moodle. And you might say, huh, what is new there? Well, yes, it has existed already for a very long time because through MNET, we've been um, able to connect Mahara into Moodle already and use assignment submission, use single sign on and all of that. However, what is changing now with this assignment submission plugin, the new one, is that it is based on web services. So over the last three and a half years, we have been working towards um, making LTI available for um, authentication as well as um, assignment submission and uh, in using Moodle that is through the external tool. However, that doesn't give you a lot of possibilities because in the external tool, yes, you have LTI, so it can work with any learning management system and it is standard in Moodle. There is no plugin that needs to be installed. It pre-populates the connection from the site admin level and all the feedback is in Mahara which is nice because then you keep it with the portfolio and archiving of submissions is possible. Now, why do you need a plugin? Well, a plugin is really great because we are not just confined to the LTI web services, but we have the whole gamut that Moodle provides available. So that means you can use the normal assignment plugin. Um, with the extension for the Mahara portfolios. Therefore, you have more grading options available. You can use the rubric, you can use marking sheets, you can use your entire marking workflow and all the marking states instead of just being able to give a number as a grade. It is also highly configurable um, so that you can add more things to it or change things around. Um, and also the feedback stays in Moodle which is especially good for those organizations that do need to, keep the put, um, need to keep the feedback and the grades in one place. And what will come very shortly as well is the archiving of submissions. So the development of this plugin um, has been made possible through um, Waitama District Health Board, where we already have it in use uh, with an earlier version and also recently through Monash University and then also funding from our organization itself. And if you want to see a few screenshots of what that um, connection between Moodle and Mahara looks like, then you can take a look at my presentation last week at uh, the Global Moodle Mood online. Um, slides are in English and if you know German, then you can also watch the video. We will be doing a webinar though at some point, um, probably within the next couple of months in order to introduce the plugin also to the English speaking world. Now, if you do want to get a head start on things and grab it quickly and get it testing, then you can do so because the plugin as it is right now is already uh, publicly available. It will be in the Moodle uh, plugin database uh, shortly. And um, for Mahara, you will need a few patches because um, the web services that we created are new and therefore will only go into Mahara 20.10. However, they do also work with um, older versions and therefore can be backported. If you need assistance, you know where to find uh, people who can help you with that. But now kind of coming back to you. Um, we've seen a number of things um, that you can use Mahara for in the formal context and more in the informal context. And for me, in a lot of ways, um, that boils down to authentic tasks um, that you can do really, really well in portfolios because you show the actual evidence that the student has produced. And that evidence is not necessarily always pretty. 
um, because it is in progress, you're still working on it, you're showing an intermediate result and then the final result. And that's where the port strength of the portfolio is, I find, that you can see the process and not only the product, um, especially when you are interested in the process. And you have that authenticity there. You can get to know students better through the work that they are doing because you see the actual evidence. And so what I'd like to ask you now in the remaining minutes until the next session is, how are you using portfolios? What are you doing with them? Have you changed your practices over the last few months um, that you've been working from home, that your students have been at home? And please feel free to use the shared notes directly in big blue button to take your notes. Um, or if you are on the live stream and therefore don't have access um, to the uh, uh, to the shared notes, um, there is a tiny URL here taking you to a Padlet um, where you can also share your ideas and we'll then collate all of them and uh, share them on the community site and see where we can make them more accessible and um, also put them in the newsletter or in any of our case studies. So I'm really interested to hear what you have to you say. And I'm auto muted. You've accidentally muted yourself somehow. Right now, I'm muted. No, I didn't didn't mute myself, and that was like your Sam. It suddenly just muted. Um, and so yes, so you're you're very welcome to uh, share your ideas. And now would also be the time to uh, grab the microphone if you'd like to say something instead of writing it.